We won't. Yeah, Kelly, we won't see the chat box, right? Uh, no, you will not. So I will read the questions to you at the end. So good morning, everyone. My name is Kelly Nye Langerman. I am a research associate here at the University of Minnesota, and I am excited to welcome you to the sixth um, video and webinar in a series of 10 um, called Make uh, make work a part of your plan. This webinar series is a partnership between the Institute on Community Integration and the Minnesota Department of Human Services. So Laura, if you could click next slide, that would be helpful to me. And Jeffrey Nurek, I am going to unmute you and you can do the lovely introduction for us. So take it away, Jeffrey. Hello, my name is Jeffrey I'm I'm not expecting a university or many donors. It is just a community in the city. We are part of the many donors to pop up every university to bring you a website that will make you work a part of your plan. This series of 10 webinars will come on a variety of topics. Around the primary community, support and policy in Minnesota. Today's webinar is titled The Power of Partnership Introduction. When it comes to finding jobs for anybody, it is important to customize it around their traits and abilities. When we talk about Job seekers with disabilities, we know all to be keep by talking about the chips and tennis. This webinar will provide higher, will highlight the power of positive language about job seekers when we move to businesses. Please enjoy this webinar. Thank you, Jeffrey. And Laura, if you could click to the next slide, please. So the session objectives uh, for today are to spend some time talking about using person-centered thinking tools around positive introductions and using a strength-based approach in job development. We're also going to talk a bit more about developing strategies to build trust and partnerships with local businesses. And we're going to spend a quite a great deal of time today understanding how to engage job seekers in the process of job development. Next slide, please, Laura. And so, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce today's two speakers from in Creative Employment Opportunities in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Edward Sheehy, who is the CESP at Creative Employment Opportunities. And um, Edward is a graduate of Notre Dame University and brings a wide variety of experience to his position at CEO. These have included purchasing, inventory control, logistics, and most notably 20 years of experience in retail shop owners ownership and management. He is the founder and proprietor of the Port, an award-winning fish market in Milwaukee South Side, and as such, he feels a particular affinity for the small business entrepreneur and the importance of the customer-first business model in hiring and training employees. He brings a hands-on, practical approach to his role of job developer and job coach. As an accomplished singer and songwriter, Edward is a longtime Special Olympics coach where he has learned that hard work and desire to succeed are far more significant than one's limitations. And I'd also like to introduce uh, Edward's colleague, Laura Owens, who's the founder and president of Creative Employment Opportunities which she founded in 1991. She's currently an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in the Department of Exceptional Education, where she teaches courses focusing on high school inclusion and transition from school to work. She's also the president of uh, Trans, or was the president of Transcend, or is the president of Transcend, an organization based in Rockville, Maryland, that provides training and technical assistance around the country to improve edu education and employment outcomes for individuals with disabilities. Laura was the Executive Director of AFSI, the Association of People Supporting Employment First, a national organization focused on the advancements of, advancement of integrated employment for citizens with disabilities in Washington, D.C. from 2008 to 2014. 
and she is known as an internationally known speaker, having presented to business organizations, schools, and conferences across the world. So we are pleased to welcome um, Edward and Laura today, and they will be taking over the presentation. I will be watching the chat box for your questions if you'd like to save those until the end. Um, otherwise, Laura and Edward, take it away. Great, thank you uh, very much, Kelly and Jeffrey. Um, so we're excited to, to talk a little bit about what we do here at Creative Employment Opportunities and um, how we assist individuals with disabilities in obtaining and maintaining integrated employment. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to talk about is um, we have three rules in our organization. The first rule is that everyone is job ready. Um, what we tend to do in our field in education and in rehabilitation is we make assumptions about the readiness of people um, to be able to work in the community and kind of make them jump through hoops to show that they're ready. So we have to believe in our job seeker. Um, at Transcend, we really kind of looked at um, what are some of the key characteristics of high-performing um, employment consultants. And one of them was principled optimism, um, which basically meant that you believe in your job seeker, that you look and you find things that are um, skills that are marketable and everybody has them, that there are no prerequisites, um, that people don't have to have certain skills and abilities because the reality is in most jobs, you might have some of the skills that an employer is looking for, but more than likely they will be teaching you all of the skills that they want for their particular business when they hire you. Um, really important is to work with the current skills that the person has and then look for positions based on an individual's interests and passions. I think that in our organization, and you'll see through the stories that we're going to talk about, um, that we really believe we can, we can teach anybody to do anything as long as they're interested in it. If they're not, that's when they're going to fail on a job, and it's not has nothing to do with being job ready. It's because they're not interested, um, and they really aren't, aren't wanting to do that particular job. And then finally, finding a position that maximizes a person's abilities and minimizes their disabilities. So we know going in that people have disabilities, that's why they're coming to our organization, um, but there's no point in focusing on their disabilities. What we need to do is really maximize what abilities they have and how they can benefit the business. The person you're seeing here is Abby. Um, what I will be doing as we move along is offering examples, concrete examples of, of uh, real clients and how they, how they fit in with uh, the sort of things that Laura has brought up. Uh, one of the things that's pretty standard um, when I meet clients for the first time and begin to kind of dig in a little bit is to ask, what's your dream job? What, if you could do anything, what would it be? And as tried as that sounds, it offers real clues. As you know, with most particularly young people, uh, that means I'm going to hear about music and video games and sports. But when I asked Abby, what's your dream job, she burst out smiling and said, I'm going to make Abby cakes. Turns out, Abby loved to bake, mostly at home. She didn't have any professional experience at all. She never had an actual job. But she dreamed of one day being the proprietor of her own bakery making fancy baked goods. So um, I found such a bakery not too far from where she lives. You can see a picture of it there, a great name, Oh What A Day Cafe. Well, what they needed at the moment was somebody to wash the dishes. It's a very small place, which meant that although Abby was going to start washing dishes, she would be in proximity of all these neat things going on, and she could learn a little bit by osmosis. Sometimes we get lucky. And as Abby was completing her temporary work experience at the cafe, suddenly they got a contract with a large supermarket chain to package and sell big quantities of cookies and cupcakes. So suddenly they had a big new need in packaging. They gave Abby a shot at it. She was very good at it. This is a hand-wrapped sort of operation. And the next thing you know, Abby was hired permanently um, primarily to package. She still does some dishes. Um, she's now just a regular part of the crew, 
she's a bright light in that store, and um, she's even begun to serve some customers, which is um, she's ever increasing in her not just her abilities but her value to the cafe. So I would say don't be terribly surprised if someday you see Abby cakes on the shelf because it just might happen. And I think what's great about that story is that um, it shows career advancement within an, a company, and that's the other thing that we promote. But not only is everybody job ready, but really looking at how can we expand what they do. So she went in there entry level, not having any kind of uh, job or work experience prior to um, being on board with Oh What a Day Cafe. So she started out as a dishwasher, as many people do, but she didn't end up as a dishwasher. She's now doing so much more. Um, and that kind of leads to our idea of, you know, we have three killer concepts that we talk a lot about. Um, one is the idea of readiness, which, again, um, readiness to us kind of means pre, and pre means never. So if you're in a pre-vocational program, pre-training, chances are you're never going to leave that. You're always going to end up in that pre-area, especially if you have a disability. So this idea that you need to be ready for employment before we can help you find a job is something that we really sort of dispute. Um, and a lot of times, and Edward will probably tell some additional stories about how we, we work with people who other people say, well, they really can't get a job. They're really not employable, but we're going to give them to you anyway. And we end up helping them find a job. So just kind of thinking differently about that readiness model, that readiness means um, motivation, it means interest, it means exposure. That, that's how we, we make people ready. Um, the other is realistic. Um, and what we mean by that is that there's no reality police, that we're not, you know, Edward and I and our team, we're not going to tell somebody that their career goal is not realistic and not something they should pursue. Um, and sometimes what we do is have to turn that into self-determination activity where we say, okay, if this is what you want to do. So on the bottom you'll see, so you want to be a rap star, which we do get quite a lot, is, you know, I want to be a rap star, I want to be an NBA basketball player. Um, then, okay, so what do you need to do to, to be that? What do you want to do to be a carpenter, to be a rap star? What skills do you need? What skills do you have? What can you work on now? And what supports do you need? And what can we do? And Sometimes what happens is they continue with that dream, but then we always go back to, well, and you know, when anybody became a rap star or when anybody became an NBA player, there was always a fallback. So what, what else can we do? And then we sort of work towards their goal of getting a job. And it might be in the industry, it might be in the field, um, but I think also just trying to find out why they're interested in that versus just sort of disputing it and saying, you know, that's not realistic, so let's go have you stock shelves in a grocery store. And then never kind of wraps readiness and realistic up into this nice little ball that, you know, you're not ready for employment, you're not being realistic about your career goals, and so you're just never going to get a job. And I, I think that's really short-sighted, um, and I think that, you know, as an edu a former educator and now working in rehabilitation, um, it really is important for us to really listen to our job seekers and find out what they really want and then to help us figure out how to get them there. This is John, um, and trust me when I tell you that this may perhaps be the most flattering picture of John that I could find. Um, we met John, he's an older fellow, he hadn't worked in many, many years, but he had such an enthusiasm, he just kept saying, whatever you tell me to do, I'll do the very best. So I asked him, I said, well, John, you know, what do you want to do? And his first answer was, I can't make this up, he said, I'd really like to work with tigers. Okay, well, we talked a little bit about working with animals, perhaps, maybe not tigers to start out with. Um, I did explain to him that the only tigers in town were probably at the zoo. There were some pretty strict zoological qualifications in order to do that, so maybe we need to change directions a little bit. John said, well, tigers are messy, and somebody's got to clean up. And that's what I'm really good at. Well, bingo. John had given me a clue. And um, right near his home, he really didn't want to ride the bus. He really wanted to be able to ride his bicycle. So that was somewhat restricted. And that's always an issue. 
but there was um, a new experimental farm, if you will, right in the heart of Milwaukee South Side, all indoors. It was a combination fish farm and vegetable farm where this whole thing was in a kind of a symbiotic uh, system. But it was a farm, and it was run by, forgive me, but pretty much all men, and it was a mess. So John and I went to visit, thinking, well, maybe he can feed the fish or something along those lines. And um, John, John went in the restroom and came out with a look on his face like, that's unbelievable in there. I got to fix this. Give me a chance. I'll make it shine. We lined up a temporary work experience, and John showed up the first day. He had gone to a store and purchased all kinds of scrub brushes and industrial chemicals and everything, all of his own money, and walked in there and spent an entire day on two bathrooms. When he came out and everybody went in to look, jaws dropped. It wasn't the same room. It was astounding. And the next thing you know, um, he was all over the building. He did get to feed a few fish, but primarily a janitorial job. And um, when his temporary job ended, they hired him. Well, we thought we had it made until this grand operation about a year or two later ran out of funding or grants or whatever they were operating on and closed their doors. So here we are again, but right close to John's home was um, a, a grade school in a suburban school district, um, and they advertised needing people to clean the rooms in the summer. This is an operation they do at almost every school. They empty everything out of a room into the hallway, scrub it top to bottom, and move everything back in. And sure enough, they hired John. He was partnered with a young man who could do quite a bit of the heavier lifting, but they worked as a team, and John just loved it. The idea that he was cleaning up after little kids and providing them with a, a safe environment, he just took it to heart. When fall came, um, he said, that's all I want to do. I just want to do this in the summer times. And that has been arranged, and John, right now, can't wait for June. Mm -hmm. So rule number two is that the glass is always half full. Um, again, principled optimism, um, believing in your candidates, um, but then also believing in employers. I think a lot of times, um, you know, we sort of blame employers and say that, you know, it's because employers don't understand. Um, they do, and, and I think the, we have met the enemy and he is us. And I think a lot of times we just have to go in with the idea that, you know, I'm going to find out what this employer needs. I'm going to find out what their business is like, and that's my first entree. My first entree is not going in saying, do you have jobs? Because that's what's going to happen is you're going to say, um, the employer's going to say, no, we don't have any jobs. Um, so your first entree is really getting to know the business, really getting to, like you got to know the job seeker, now really getting to know the business and understanding that there are always, always, always opportunities in, in businesses. It's up to us then to figure out how we can go in and match up the job seekers' skills and interests with what the needs of the business are. So having that principled optimism, um, really getting to know the job seeker and the employer is so important. And having that attitude that the glass is always half full is our rule number two. Um, so the example for this one is um, Maddie. Uh, Maddie is a young woman that um, actually when CEO started in 1991, which Seems like it was just yesterday, but I guess it wasn't. Um, Maddie lived in Madison, and she um, moved from the institution where she lived in Madison to a group home in Milwaukee. And she has a fabulous guardian um, who said, I, I don't want her in a segregated environment. I want her working in the community. Um, so Maddie is deaf and blind, um, and she's, they say she has an intellectual disability, but I honestly think Maddie is one of the smartest people I know. Um, but Maddie and I would go every week um, to the Pizza Hut, which was down the block from her group home. And I would sort of hang out with Maddie and, and spend some time with her. And the, the first um, job opportunity we got, um, 
was with the local hospital and I thought it was great. She put together all the crash cart needs and she filled up the supplies and she was really good at it because she's very tactile oriented. Um, but after like 45 minutes to an hour of being in the hospital, she started really getting anxious and she would start making noises. And then literally one day the crash cart crashed. She like threw it across the room. Um, she started hitting me and pulling my hair. Um, and I didn't, I couldn't figure out what was going on. And so, you know, in the old days, we probably would have said, well, Maddie's not job ready. Um, and so, you know, looking at that glass is half full, I said, there's, there's an opportunity. There's a reason why she's acting this way. Um, well, ultimately, what we found out was the institution where she had come from was not a very pleasant place for Maddie, and so she was abused, and, and there were some issues, and the hospital smelled just like the institution, and being deaf and blind, your major sense is smell. So she didn't know me very, very well, and so she kind of thought I was putting her back in the institution. Um, so obviously, that didn't work. but. Needless to say, all this time, we continued once a week to go have pizza, um, and we had tactile signs that Maddie used, so she would get to choose if she wanted cheese pizza or pepperoni pizza, if she wanted Diet Coke or if she wanted milk. Um, and so one day the manager came up and said, you know, this is so interesting. I'm really intrigued. I've watched you guys here for, I think it was a year. <laughs> I watched you, um, you know, have lunch with her once a week. And I'm just really intrigued. And so we started talking. And I said, yeah, this is this is Maddie. And we're we're looking for, you know, employment for her ultimately. But, you know, I'm just trying to get to know her a little bit. And he said, you know, and again, sometimes it's luck, as Edward said. So as luck would have it, this manager of this Pizza Hut actually had a son with a disability. And he said, I would be able to hire Maddie. Let me figure out how to do this. So, um, so he hired her. And she initially started... Um, making the pizza sauce until Pizza Hut didn't make pizza sauce anymore. Um, then she washed the windows, and she was actually the best wash, window washer ever because she was so systematic about it. You know, she wasn't looking, but she, obviously, but she had, you know, she did it really well. She made pizza boxes. She rolled silverware. And in the back of the picture, you can see the salad bar. Ultimately, what we had her do is she actually stocked the salad bar. We put tactile signs around the salad bar so she knew where each item went. And what happened was then all the people who are blind in the community started going to that pizza hut because they could they could actually go to the salad bar without assistance from people. Um, so Maddie worked at Pizza Hut for 18 years. Um, she had 10 managers, so she outlived 10 managers in those 18 years. And unfortunately, three years ago when our recession hit, the last manager said, you know what, we just really can't afford Maddie anymore, um, you know, so we're going to have to lay her off. Um, so, again, the glass is half full. Okay, she's got 18 years of experience. She's grown as a person. Um, she can do a lot of things, and I think she can do a lot more than what she was doing at Pizza Hut. Um, so I met with a, a colleague of mine at Menominee Falls School District, and um, she's a wonderful director of people services, and she said, you know what, I think we we have a need. We have a clerical need. We've got all the, these files that need to be purged. We've got all this the stuff that needs to be sent out to the PTA. Um, I want to figure out a way to hire Maddie because I also want to walk the walk. I want my teachers to see that Menominee Falls School District actually hires somebody with a significant disability, so there's no excuse. There's no excuse that we can't transition our young adults with disabilities into work. Um, so Maddie's been working um, three days a week at Menominee Falls School District. She ha has gotten several wage increases, um, and her job is full. And, and it's just a really, really positive experience now that she's got all these opportunities at the Menominee Falls School District. So given that story um, and the idea that the glass is half full, um, this is kind of our mantra that there's a job for everyone who wants one regardless of the severity of their disability, their need for support, or the economic vitality of their community. Um, you know, employers need good people even in bad economic times. And some people are going to need a lot of support in the beginning, but employers really will rise to the occasion. 
And so we really have to go back to that, you know, principled optimism, the glass is half full, um, that there's no reality police, that all people can and should be working in the community so that they can be contributing members of their society. The third rule is no job stuffing. Um, and basically what we mean by that is a lot of times what will happen is jobs will come through as Edward might be going around the community um, and then we'll come back as a team and say, well, you know, I saw this employer's hiring, this employer's hiring. And then we look at our candidate list um, and if nobody matches, we don't just pull somebody and say, you're going to that job anyway because there's a need. We'll reach out to others or we'll, we'll, we'll reach out to our vocational rehabilitation and let them know that there's an opportunity. But there's no point in like kind of stuffing somebody into a job opportunity where they don't really have the skills, they don't really have the interest. Um, so we really believe that we really want to make that good job match between the individual job seeker and the employer. When I met Robert, it was evident right from the beginning that he was really, really smart. Um, and Robert is an artist. He loves to draw. His dream is to someday create either graphic novels or perhaps even a, his own comic book. And that's what he was, that, that's his passion. So to be honest, finding him a job drawing comics, not very likely. So a tactic that we use a lot is when somebody really tells us something that they love to do, is ask them why. What is it about that activity that you like? So I asked Robert that very question. Well, why do you like drawing? And some very interesting things came out. He said, well, I like it quiet. He said, I like working by myself. And he said, I love having the opportunity to work out something to the tiniest detail so everything is just perfect. Well, these are all really valuable clues. If I can't find him a job, if I can't find him a job as an artist, I can certainly look for a job that incorporates those things that he likes. Um, in a previous life or two, um, I had spent some time delivering things to various offices around town, including law offices. And I recalled that most law offices, probably all of them, um, are constantly sending and receiving all kinds of mail and packages from all over. And somebody needs to be the coordinator in the mailroom. So I contacted a local lawyer that I knew who put me in touch with a very large law firm, covers uh, four stories in Milwaukee's tallest building. So it's a huge law firm. And before long, Robert was hired, and he became sort of the king of the building. He would be working by himself uh, in the early evening hours. He would go cover all four floors, picking up various packages from workstations around the building, bringing them back to the mailroom, and making sure that everything was exactly perfect before the FedEx UPS mail people came to pick them up. You can imagine in a law firm that if this package has to be in Kansas City by 10 a.m. tomorrow, you better have everything in order and exactly right, or some lawyer is going to blow a gasket the next day. So Robert took to this. He loved it. He was like the king of the building. Um, that was, I believe, four years ago, and last year when I talked to Robert, he had been promoted to full-time. He started out half-time, full-time with benefits, still doing some of this, but also now working in their processing room where they create printed materials. And to top it all off, while he's doing this, Robert is going to art school and paying his own way. So clearly job preferences are important, and this is just a fun sort of way of um, making that point. So if you look at the Peanuts cartoon line, it says, I'd hate to have a job where you had to get up early in the morning. Um, Charlie Brown says, I'd hate to have a job where you stayed in the same place all day. And Lucy said, I'd hate to have a job where you had to be nice to everybody. So clearly job preferences are important, and that's really what our focus is. 
This is another quick story because I, I want to make sure we have enough time for chain for questions. Um, but Jay is a young man with a significant physical disability at Best Buy in Virginia. Um, and he sort of hung out at Best Buy. He applied for positions all during um, in the strip mall and um, he was denied. And by the time he got down to the end of the strip mall where Best Buy was, his battery had worn out. So he would ask them if they would charge his battery. And then he hung out in the home stereo department. Well, after, I guess, a couple of years, this is Jay's story um, and the, the manager's story to me. Um, he, the manager came up and said, why aren't you working for us? You're here all the time. Um, and he said, yeah, why aren't I working for us? And I, I met Jay because he um, has, you know, his verbal skills are pretty challenging. And I was at the Best Buy and I heard him and I heard him talking to this guy, um, this customer. And the customer was really, you know, listening to everything Jay had to say about what kind of GPS he should buy for his vehicle. And I was just amazed. And so when I got the story and I found out, you know, that Jay really got his own job by being there and just hanging out and being part of the Best Buy culture, um, I think it was just an awesome story. So these are the things that we kind of focus on when it comes to, um, you know, positive personal profiles is getting to know the job seeker, getting to know the employer, and then where we connect the two, that's where we find the good job match. And then once the person gets the job, we have to support both. We support both the job seeker and we support the employer. This is Ted. Ted was a senior at a local high school. Ted has autism. Just as nice a young man as you could know. Um, wanted to follow in his brother's footsteps as a star athlete, and I think you can almost picture what happened. Tad had spent the last couple of years, the proudest thing that he did was he was on the varsity football team, and his position was substitute place kicker, which is short for in play. He sat on the bench for two years, and one day he went to the coach and said, I want to play. And the coach being a you know, gruff old football coach said, well, work harder. Tad started running more, lifting weights, practicing extra hours, all of those things. And sure enough, the coach noticed and eventually put him in a game. Fast forward, Tad is in a job interview. I'm sitting next to him. He's doing fine until that famous question that everybody asks, give me an example of a time you had a problem at work and what did you do to solve it? Well, Tad looked over at me with a kind of a panicked look on his eye because A, he'd never had a job and B, he was totally blanked. He didn't know what to say. And all I did was just turn to him and say, Tad, tell the football story. So he told the story I just told about how he eventually got into a game. So all I did, I sat there and I said, so Tad, what did you learn from that? And he looked up and he said, if you work really hard, good things happen. <laughs> I could have kissed him. <laughs> it was just one of the best answers I think I've ever heard. And believe it or not, that uh, the, the recruiter hired him right on the spot. She congratulated him. She said, with that kind of attitude, you'll do fine here. So, yeah, you have to know your client well enough to offer a little prompt and then let them carry the ball. So getting to know your job seeker, um, Edward does this really well, and I was just talking to one of our newer colleagues the other day, and we have a positive personal profile, which is actually a format that we use that really helps somebody new kind of go through and figure out what what are the positives of this person. Because, you know, you can't sell what a person can't do. So you really have to go in there and say, I've got this candidate who can do X, Y, and Z, just like Tad. You know, what what is it? Why Why should we hire you? And so we really kind of look at the three Ps, personality, preferences, and previous experiences. And, and Edward's really good at it. He now does the personal positive profile kind of in his head. Um, but, you know, to really have some sort of format, because it's always going to change and kind of always building on that so that you can make sure that people move on in their careers. 
So this is kind of the positive personal profile in a nutshell. I mean, we look at everything about the person and we build this positive pro personal profile with the person, with their support people, with people who know them, and then we add to it as we get to know them and spend time. So we find out what their likes are, their dislikes, their interests. Um, they're positive personality traits, and everybody's got them. Sometimes it's a little hard to find, but they're always there. What are their values? You know, do they do they go to church, and so Sunday is out for work? I mean, do they do they value uh, you know save you know do they like the earth, and so they value saving the earth, and is that something you can build on? Um, looking at creative solutions for accommodations, their support systems, their dreams, their goals. Environmental preferences, so, so important. You know, do they like to work inside, outside, with people, without people? Um, so building that profile is really, really important. And then adding to that is kind of looking at um, this idea that sometimes people will say, you know, this person's not motivated, particularly students. They'll say, you know, they're not motivated. And so we kind of think that we start in the middle of the conversation then. Um, you can't have motivation until you build some interest. And the only way you build your interest is through exposure. So we really believe strongly in job shadows, in, in internships, and in really getting people out there so that they're exposed to a variety of opportunities rather than just sort of pigeonholing them and saying, well, your only experience was, you know, cleaning the school cafeteria while you were in school. And if somebody says, you know, I'm not interested in working, and that's their only exposure to work, that's probably because they're not interested in that kind of job. And so they don't realize that there are so many things out there. Um, and I have a gazillion stories about it, but but we want questions later. So so this idea, I think this is really important. So exposure leads to interest, and interest builds that motivation. And then once you have that, then you can build an action plan for somebody. And then looking at changing the deficits to assets, and this is just a fun little thing that, that we um, have that kind of looks at everybody has deficits. Um, but for us, we tend to flip it. You know, like if if we have a deficit, we always make it a positive, and that's what we need to do with individuals with disabilities too, who are looking for jobs, is figuring out how can we change that deficit to an asset. So these are just some, you know, short attention span. They have a lot of interest. Um, they're hyperactive. Well, they're energetic. They're going to move around and do a lot of things. And so, where can we make those matches happen? So this is an example of Ivan, and I'm, I'm going to start it, and then Edward will finish the story. Um, but Ivan's positive personal profile, I did a um, person-centered planning meeting with him, um, and uh, he, he brought his family, he brought his best friend from high school, he brought his brothers and sisters, his teacher. So I think there are probably like 10 people in the room, and we all did this positive personal profile, person-centered planning meeting. And these are all the things we found out about him. Because again, it's really about him and his passion. So Edward took this information then, and he started looking at um, opportunities in the community. And, and if you see that, you know, the number one thing was that Ivan really loved sports, all sports, all Wisconsin sports. So Brewers, Packers, Bucks, Marquette, Golden Warrior, Golden, what is it, Golden Eagles. <laughs> they changed it from when I was when I was around. Um, so anything to do with sports, but particularly Wisconsin sports, and particularly Marquette. So Edward went and he talked with um, Marquette, and they clearly needed help. So do you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, this was really really fortunate. Uh, I, I went in and talked to the, the man who runs the Student Recreation Center, which is a huge building with tennis courts, with five basketball courts. Um, the students come in, and although they're all supposed to change their shoes when they come in after uh, uh, in December with the salty sidewalks and all, they don't. And as a result, the basketball courts get really dirty really fast. So when I talked to the, the uh, director, he quickly identified that as a place that uh, he really needed help. And I love to take credit for it, but truthfully, he was the one who initially realized that the way they cleaned the basketball courts up until this point was to take a wet towel attached to a huge, heavy board, and one of the janitorial staff would literally drag it behind them, behind uh, on the basketball court to, to wipe it clean. 
It's sort of like using a mule, only it was the janitorial staff, and they hated this job. It was hard. This thing is very heavy. John, the director, took one look at Ivan, and one look at Ivan for most people would see disability. A disability. <laughs> this is a young man with cerebral palsy in a wheelchair, doesn't speak well. Uh, how in the world is that going to work? John took one look at that motorized wheelchair and how well Ivan could turn on a dime and control it so well with his hand control, he absolutely realized that there was a much better way to clean the courts. And this was the birth of what we called the human Zamboni. So Edward then put a proposal together with John, the, the manager, um, and said, this is a perfect match, so let's take a look at it. And this is the human Zamboni, this is Ivan. And you can see his adaptation, uh, the, the uh, Zamboni machine attached to his wheelchair. And I have watched Ivan just thrive um, when I go there from time to time. It's so amazing to watch him. I think his favorite part of the job, sure, silly, is telling these big basketball players to please get off the court so he yeah. can ride it down. Um, he's also getting stray balls. He's also doing some um, some uh, off 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 time. Uh, uh, um, what is this called? Uh, Scorekeeping, scorekeeping um, for intramurals and things like that. So he's developed the whole community there. And we don't have time to show the video, but if you Google human Zamboni, Marquette, Marquette it'll come up. So we just want to end with these uh, final things for you to think about. Um, the first one is don't let your ego get in the way of the task at hand. Um, I just We just think this is a funny uh, picture of firefighters posing in front of the burning building. Um, I think sometimes what happens is we um, kind of take a look at, um, you know, our egos and where, where we are and say, well, this person can't do this because. Um, so, you know, you kind of kind of have let your ego go and let employers kind of direct us and tell us where, um, you know, where we need to go with that candidate. Um, the other thing is try a new perspective, and as you can see from our stories, and um, it's always about looking differently. It's always about that glass is half full. It's always about, well, this didn't work this way, but how do we get it to work? Because it can. Um, and then don't let constraints deter you. I mean, we're always there's always going to be excuses. And Edward and I were actually talking about this yesterday. And I'm, you know, we can always have excuses for why things aren't the way we want them to be, or why things aren't working, or you know, this employer won't do that, or this candidate can't do that, or this teacher won't do this, or this parent, or whatever. But those are just those are self-imposed constraints. I mean, I think that you know we've learned that we just need to sort of say, okay, we can't go this direction, then we'll find another direction to help that person. And then the final thing is to keep your eyes on the prize, um, because this is really about um, making sure that individuals with disabilities are citizens of their communities, that they're contributing members. This is about Dan working at Steins. It's about Anna working at The Gap. It's about Simon working at a law firm. It's about Jose working at a dot-com company. Um, that, this is why we do what we do. And so we have to have that belief um, that individuals with disabilities have the same rights that you and I have to be living and working in the community. Um, and this is, this is my personal favorite, <laughs> Winston Churchill, we have to believe. A pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, and optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. And I think that's what we do is we try and um, look at the optimist side and figure out how do we move beyond that. Um, so that's, that's what we have. Um, so comments, questions, thoughts, reflections, ideas, debate, dialogue, stump the presenter. <laughs> I'm gonna add one last thought. Um, there's a real feeling when we do succeed, and nobody bats a thousand. We don't always succeed, but when we do, my sense is that those folks who are the first person with a disability to work are really our pioneers. They are educating their co-workers about disability. They're educating their families, and they deserve an enormous amount of our respect because they are making the next person down the line, that next person with a disability is just going to be incrementally that better a chance 
because of these pioneers. That's my, my last thought there. Mm -hmm. So do we have questions? Uh, hi, everyone. This is Kelly. And Laura, if you want to click to the next slide that has your contact information, that would be great. I sent a note to everyone to put their questions in the chat box. Um, I'm not going to unmute everyone just because that would kind of be a free-for-all. But if you want to send a note um, to me directly or a question to Edward and Laura, um, that would be great. That usually takes a minute or two. Um, what I do, maybe to kind of get the conversation going, um, Laura and Edward, about questions is, is um, can you talk about when you first meet a job seeker, maybe a job seeker with some pretty significant um, employment challenges, where do you sort of begin that conversation? You talked about developing that positive, positive um, employment profile, but can you talk a little bit more about what that goes sort of who's at the table when you do that and what that looks like for you and your organization? Yeah, so um, it can it can take the form of multiple ways. So in Ivan's case, we actually did a full-blown um, person-centered planning meeting. So it was his transition year, and so the teacher said, you know, we really need to figure out how Ivan can work. He had a fabulous teacher. So we did an actual person-centered planning meeting that got things started, really got to know Ivan, got to know the, his family, you know, got to know, you know, important things like every year they go back to Mexico. And so that's the other reason this is such an, a good job because he's off during the time that they go to Mexico. And so it, it worked out perfectly. So we got to know all those little details. And then we developed an action plan of how we're going to move forward and what the next steps are. But as we were doing that, so, so that was one, one tool that we used. And then Edward spent some more time, and then we talked together, and we kind of just continued to, to get to know Ivan and his community and got to know his family a little bit more. But then the positive personal profile, you could do multiple ways. I mean, I always feel like like hanging out with intent is so important. I mean, it really is about spending time with somebody. I think, uh, you know, our systems haven't caught up with the best way of, of um, funding what we do, unfortunately. Um, but truly, um, we have found that if we spend enough time up front to really get to know the person, um, it's not about sitting down and interviewing them. So that positive personal profile has questions, but it's not about just sitting down and jotting that information and another piece of paperwork that you put in the file. It's about, okay, this is something for me to build on. So now I'm going to also maybe talk to your family member that you live with, and then I'm also going to talk to your neighbor, and then I'm also, you know, so people who know that individual that can give us additional information and additional detail about their interests and their passions and what they're like as a person. Um, and then, like, just spending time with the person. So, um, you know, I remember Elizabeth was an individual I worked with years ago, and um, I just spent time with her in her community. We walked around her neighborhood, and I was simply amazed that everybody in the community knew Elizabeth. Everybody knew her. Oh, because so, she would shop at Bath and Body. She would shop at Sendex. She would go places with her mom. So everybody knew her. And so it, it gave me a whole new take on who Elizabeth was as a person, um, her personality, what people thought of her. Um, so it, it, I really think that this positive personal profile is really just about spending time with that person up front. And we have like little data, you know, just within our company because we're, we're small. But we have some small data that show that the more time we spend with somebody up front, the more likely we will find them that job that they actually stay in and are happy with. If we are forced, um, because of funding, um, to just quickly find a job for somebody and it's not really the best match, we do find that they come back, you know, within a year or two because it's not the match that they that they wanted.
Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I was on mute that whole time. <laughs> I apologize. So I do have a few questions here for you. Um, I'm sorry to make everyone wait. I know one of the pressing questions that we've heard a couple times before um, is in regards to the average length of time that sort of getting to know to job placement takes. Everyone definitely has obviously a very unique experience, but do you have some comments on your personal and professional experience with job seekers on how long that sort of looks and feels on average? Well, to be frank, um, because we are funded with tax dollars, we are conscious of the time ticking by, and we basically do our best to calculate uh, uh, how much time we are willing to spend on that client based on re uh, recuperating the money that is spent doing that. Now, does that always work? No. But that the goal is uh, um, to actually come out on the positive side um, and that, that kind of dictates it. Um, and that's an easy thing to say and a hard thing to do. Yeah, because, you know, we get, and I don't know if Minnesota's the same, but we're outcome-based funding. So we, Edward does all of his work, and we have to pay him, but we don't get any money until that person starts the job. And then once they start the job, it, we bill for that start date, but then it's, you know, 30, 60, 90 days before we actually get paid for it. So we kind of have sort of this internal formula that looks at what his hourly rate would look like. And so we kind of, you know, say, this is your goal. Your goal is within two months um, to be able to at least get somebody an internship, or if not a, a job, um, but at least something that we can bill for, that we can continue to bill on. Um, but we're notorious for... Um, spending spending longer for some people, and and quite honestly, you know, I know everybody asks that question, but honestly, we are dealing with individuals. We're dealing with individual employers, so sometimes it's it, it seems like luck, you know, because like I'll give examples in team meetings, and people are like, that only happens to you, Laura. That some that like the employer just jumps and says, yeah, I'm going to hire that person. Um, no, sometimes it's just, you know, I, I happen to catch the employer on a good day and the candidate that I'm with is just, you know, spot on. Um, but, you know, our goal is to always try and find them something within two to four months of, of us first starting to work with them, whether that's an internship, a job shadow, something that, that we can start building that, that profile. And then, you know, ultimately employment is the is what we really want. But honestly, sometimes it takes six months. Sometimes it takes a year. Sometimes it takes a month. I mean, and it honestly doesn't even matter the severity of the disability because I don't think Ivan, I mean, Ivan was, was actually a quick, quick placement. I mean, um, and Maddie was not. <laughs> um, but, you know, some of the other folks, you know, it just, it really just so depends on the person. And there's no, I think that's the thing if we can get across is that, there's no cookbook. There's no rule. Um, it's really about that individual person and, and how much you can work with them to get to know who they are and what, they're, what they want. Excellent. Can you actually hit your next slide there, Laura, so folks can see the link to the website there? That would be great. I have a few more questions here for you. Um, one question that came in and said, can you share your thoughts on people volunteering as a way to gain work experience and skills? Yeah, so volunteering is really important. However, you need to be very cautious of volunteering because volunteering can turn into, well, this is this is what I do. You also have to be really careful of volunteering in a for-profit business because that can really only be time limited. Um, so we don't, we try not to do that. We that has to be an internship where they're actually paid um, to do it, either through vocational rehabilitation or one of their funding sources. Um, but volunteering for volunteering, if you're volunteering at a church or if you're volunteering at a, a civic, civic organization or, you know, the Boys and Girls Club, um, then, then that's fine. But then just make sure that, it's, that they're getting something out of it, that they're getting a letter of recommendation, that there's maybe an evaluation that's done annually if they're actually volunteering. Because that, that leads to, so putting it on your resume is great, but then being able to say, and here's my letter of recommendation that says that I volunteered, you know, 10 hours a week for the last six months at this organization and that I was here all the time. 
Um, so volunteering is important, but I think sometimes we kind of get stuck in that trap that volunteering is all there is. It certainly has a value uh, for those with little or no work experience mm -hmm. um, uh, in terms of building a resume, in terms of listing experiences. I mean, yeah. um, certainly it, it's a blank page. Yeah. Um, but Laura's right. It can, it, 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 it can detract from the job search. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. So this is another interesting question um, from someone that said, all the examples seem to be of individuals who are fairly likable. What challenges do you find with individuals who maybe don't have some of the likability factors due to some of the, maybe some behavioral challenge or some personality issues? And what tips do you have to kind of overcome those challenges? So That's a very good question. That's a really great question. And I, whenever we present, it's always two people that are like, well, I work with people who have this kind. So um, one of the last slides where I, that I showed just a little picture of Dan, Dan actually um, has some very significant behavioral issues. He was, he's not a very likable person. Um, and so I don't know if you, because Edward, you worked with him and, and we did sort of the positive personal profile, but then you worked with him to get the job. Dan, Dan is an, a very physically imposing guy mm -hmm. who speaks very, very minimally um, and, and with difficulty. And um, at times, if Dan decides that uh, if he wanted to get a, uh, soda out of a machine or something like that, or something that he wanted to do, he would just turn on his heel and walk away, and it was like getting in the way of a train. And nobody was going to stop him. I mean, when I did the assessment, he, like, rifled through my purse, wanted to get soda. I mean, it was, it so, was challenging. <laughs> in, in Dan's case, it really, it really became a question of keeping him away from the soda machine and um, trying to minimize those triggers. I have another client who um, actually is now hired um, as a uh, programmer, but who has tremendous anger issues, um, and at the drop of a hat is likely to lash out. And <laughs> basically what I did for about six months with, with him is have him lash out at me rather than um, the people that weren't hiring him and told him, I said, look, when you're mad, just call me, yell at me. I'll, that's what I'm getting paid for. Um, but you're right. Um, with some of these folks that we've presented you today are, in fact, quite personable. Um, but if you, find, if you find that spot for them where they can flourish, a lot of those issues tend to wane. And I think that's the key. Like with Dan, Dan is very likable now. Like he did, we, we, we avoided the trigger, like, like Edward said, of, you know, the soda machine. Um, we put parameters so that he knew. And I'll tell you, everybody loves him. In fact, when he moved from uh, where he was living to a different community, the Steins manager said, we want, we want to have him move to another Steins. I mean, that's how much people, because I think, again, it goes back to that readiness that, well, they have to get rid of their behaviors before they get a job. But the reality is once they get the job, um, that's, those behaviors really do disappear because now the expectations are a little different. So it's, it's, Again, just spending time with that person, it sounds really simplistic, I mean, again, but, but it really is what it is. Yeah, I think you bring up a really important point. This actually came up in the previous webinar. Someone had asked a question about um, supporting job seekers. I can't remember. I think they were, they were referencing individuals who uh, maybe had some um, – some legal issues around um, inappropriate sexual behavior and like how do you find a job in the community for somebody who has some pretty significant triggers and and the speakers from the other week talked about again those environmental factors that we really do have to think about what those triggers are and supporting job seekers um, in sort of environmental success. Um, but also knowing that I think, Lori and Edward, you made a great point about sometimes you just have to work through some of those things over time um, and that the job is sometimes the solution to some of those really challenging behaviors. Um, when, we raise, when, we raise those ex, when we raise those expectations, people can often surprise us and rise to the occasion. 
Not right. always, but often. Right, right. And I think sometimes also looking at the work culture, um, Edward just reminded me of a, another young man that, that we worked with years ago who used profanity all the time, and he was on a behavior plan to, to not swear anymore. And of course, I met him, and he swore, and he called me names, and I was like, wow, okay, this is really, this is really true. Like, he swore all the time. He used profanity all the time. Now, for two years, I even asked him, I said, well, you know, you're on this behavior plan. I mean, you need to stop swearing, they're saying, in order to get a job. I mean, you know, what do you think about that, Jeremy? And he was like, F the behavior plan. And I was like, oh, man. So so we were like, so instead of saying he's not job ready, I just looked at him and said, he, we're never going to get him to stop swearing. We're just not. So where can you swear on a job? And I came back to the office and we brainstormed and we brainstormed all these places and he ended up, long story short, working at a trucking logistics company where swearing is part of what they do. So the work culture is just as important. And so we're never going to stop Jeremy from swearing, but, but now he's in a, an environment where he can swear because that's what everybody does there. That's a good point. And I have one more question here, and then I have a, a little short announcement about our next webinar. Um, Edward, you work um, as an employment consultant. Can you talk about or just let us know the average amount of days or hours per week you spend on getting to know job seekers? Maybe if we know how, um, how large your caseload is and then sort of how much time during the week do you spend during that job development piece as well as that getting to know piece. Well, it's well, going to obviously week to week, but if I had to peg my own time, which may be different from someone else, I would say that I probably spend a third of my time with the clients and maybe two-thirds of the time um, speaking with employers. One of the tricks that I've learned that's very helpful is if I've found a location where they, they do need to hire someone, um, I will check it out myself. I'm not always one to take a client where the odds are long, just because that can be a discouraging thing. So I'll do that myself. But then if there's an opening, I will make sure that they, we get an application in, and then I will return and speak to whoever I can because what invariably happens is that if I start to make inroads in a conversation at a business about a client who I think can do a good job there, there at some point in the conversation they say, usually pretty quickly, well, have they applied? And if the answer is no, the conversation's over. But if the answer is, well, yes, as a matter of fact, he has applied and he should be in your system right now, that, that conversation can continue. And when they look at that, application in a stack of 100 applications, and they see that name, I've definitely increased the chances where they'll say, oh, that's that guy that the guy from the CEO came in and told us about. And trust me, if there's 100 applications in there, you want to be that guy. Yep. That's, a, that's actually a great, um, a great question to end on, too. And I think it was really interesting when you said one-third, you know, getting to know and, and FaceTime with job seekers, and then two-thirds of your time in the community talking to businesses. I think that's um, really great to hear people say that out loud because that's definitely kind of a different way of thinking um, and how we sort of approach job development um, oftentimes. And so we're going to actually explore the job development piece a little bit more next week. So I want to let folks know I, I put a link to the survey on the sheet there that I hope you'll take a moment to look at. But next week's um, webinar is going to have two guest speakers, uh, Amy from Trillium in Seattle and Janine from New England Business Associates in Massachusetts in Connecticut. And they're going to be talking about organizational investment and job development and making those connections with businesses. And I know um, Edward's also an expert on this. Uh, we're going to spread the love at our webinars and have Amy and Janine as speakers. Um, but, but obviously, job development plays a very central role in um, the work that we're doing. And so to spend a little bit more time next week to hear perspectives from, from other speakers, I also shared the link, it's on the screen there, the website, the mpccp.umn.edu backslash employment. All of the videos are recorded and they'll be captioned there eventually. Many of them are already captioned. You can also register for upcoming webinars. There's a number of different topics 
for the month of May as well. And we really appreciate your participation today. Um, and we are so grateful to have Edward and Laura as our guests today and to share their experiences and their stories. Um, I will be making a PDF form of their slides, which will also go up on the website at some point. And if you'd like to contact them, um, you can certainly, I, I was going to put your website up there, Laura, um, so people could visit um, the work that you're doing. So thank you so much. I'm going to end the recording. If you have further comments, questions, thoughts, please do not hesitate to email me. Uh, knai at umn.edu is my email address. Otherwise, I hope you have a lovely day. It's 12.05, and um, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Okay. You good? Yeah. I like it when we can't hear anybody and they're not <laughs> those questions. Not sharing. Make sure.